Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at the third and final Reanimator film, Beyond Reanimator, released in 2003. And yeah, I said final, because the 2017 Italian adaptation, Herbert West Reanimator, is not part of the same series. It's just a different adaptation of the original Lovecraft source material. Beyond Reanimator, in contrast, has no remaining ties to its Lovecraftian origins, other than the title character and the premise of returning life to the dead. It also doesn't have a lot of ties to the first two films, since only three people returned for this late arrival threequel. Director Brian Usna, effects artist Screaming Mad George, and thankfully, Jeffrey Combs as Herbert West. Other than that, everyone in the cast and crew were new to the series, and most of them were Spanish, since Beyond Reanimator was the result of a deal Usna made with Spanish film company Filmax. So even though it's supposed to take place in Arkham, Massachusetts, again. It was filmed in an abandoned Valencian prison and features a whole bunch of inmates and prison guards with heavy Spanish accents. Any less words, pendejo? Is that a little weird and unbelievable? Yeah, maybe. But that's also how you could describe this whole damn series, so whatever, man. Beyond Reanimator has essentially the same story as the original, with another wide-eyed young doctor being corrupted by the wily Herbert West in the pursuit of scientific discovery. But this time through, West claims to have found the secret to turning his reanimated zombies back into normal functioning human beings. That secret is nanoplasmic energy, which basically looks like a jar full of fire Flies, and things get pretty gory and downright silly as Wes tries to perfect his latest batch of super science serum. Perhaps its foreign production is why the movie never hit theaters, instead premiering on the Sci-Fi Channel, much to Jeffrey Combs' chagrin. But don't let its television premiere fool you. This is a gory booby movie that was merely edited down to a PG rating for TV. Obviously, I'll be using the R-rated home video release for the kill count, so I'll be talking about all the stuff you're not supposed to be watching even if I do gotta blur a lot of it to avoid getting yelled at by YouTube. How many victims will there be as Wes tears through a prison in the name of science? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins at a backyard campout with two crappy kid actors. My grandma said the soul is in the eyes. The soul is an invention of primitive witch doctor. These kids, Howie and, uh, other kid, head back inside Howie's house, where his sister Emily is enjoying a cold glass of their freshest dairy milk. Howie boo scares her and they tussle a bit, his head getting inappropriately crotchular, before a mindless and jawless zombie rounds the corner to disrupt this borderline incestual wrestling. Emily is killed when the reanimated zombie bashes her head multiple times against the wall. And to make this all extra traumatic for little Howie over there, she falls down dead right in front of him. Have fun with your psychological development after this, little bro. Howie watches as the zombie tongues at a drizzle of dairy milk, but his lactose consumption ends after a cop comes in and shoots the reanimated feller several times with his handgun. And this guy's a great horror movie cop too, cause he even double taps the zombie to make sure the thing is down. Almost as down as Howie's spirits as he cries into his dead sister's face. The cause of poor Emily's death was one Herbert West, currently being arrested by the the Arkham City Police. Yuzna says that this opening scene is meant to take place the same night as the end of Bride. In fact, the kids had mentioned earlier that Howie's house was right next to a cemetery. The same cemetery where West and Kane's house was in the second movie. From the back of a police car, West motions to young Howie that he should look down at the ground, leading Howie to discover one extra glowy syringe full of zombie juice. And a title card! Whoa, getting a little too beyond there. Come back! The credit scene sequence is the same as always, although I've got to note, I'm a little disappointed in the theme this time around, which feels a bit sedated. <laughs> No bueno. We pop out of the credits 13 years later, where an adorable rat gets caught in a trap courtesy of Herbert West. He uses the animal for his fricky fricky mad science experiments, but his work proves laborious since he has to be sure to keep it secret from the prison staff like the Sergeant Mancho do. Unfortunately for West, it turns out his latest test subject was actually a rat named Ratty, who this inmate Cabrera regards as a pet, a pet he cares so deeply about he's ready to rip feet off to find him. Where's Reddy? 
Calm down, Cabrera. Vampire Priest guy doesn't know anything. This prison is run by the slimy warden Brando, who's currently being interviewed by reporter Laura Olney, played by Elsa Pataki, who would end up being a part of those Fast and or Furious movies I still haven't watched yet. Apparently by this point, though, Pataki was already well-known in Spain, and Yuzna said he'd get hit by paparazzi whenever he was out with her and another famous actor they had for this film, Santiago Segura. So if I went out to have a dinner with them, our picture, I was, my picture with them would be on the front page of the paper, of the, new, of the regular newspaper. This was big. But the movie Reanimator, who knows? The warden uses the interview to show off his electric chair and get a little rapey with Laura. They submit to my power. All about the implication, huh, Chief? Brando's dentist system is interrupted by the arrival of the prison's new doctor, Howard Phillips, whose first task at hand is flirting with the hot reporter. Hi. Hi. Done. Second task? Fixing Moses, the vampire priest guy who's just had some kind of heart attack. Man, I really hope they have some Venture Bros sounding music whenever there's a high stakes scene like this. Heart attack. Oh, perfect, just what I had in mind. During the commotion, Santiago Segura's character, this bald Tommy Chong looking inmate named Speedball, bumps into Laura. And despite the lackadaisical way it's shot, it actually ends up injuring her. What the fuck, he barely bumped her. And get out of here, warden. You can't heal her ankle with mustache magic. Vampire priest Moses is brought into the doctor's office where the only other female character in this movie, Nurse Vanessa, gets her job usurped by Herbert West when he suggests a useful drug for Doc Howie to use. That earns West some immediate respect and an ill-advised title. Doctor! This is now the best day of Herbert West's life. West takes over for Nurse Vanessa, but it's too late to do anything. Moses, the vampire priest guy, is dead, and there's no way they can save him. He was my patient for five minutes. Womp womp. Howard tells Wes that he already knows all about it because he was Howie, the little kid who saw him get arrested the night his sister Emily was killed. And turns out he kept the syringe of reagent he found so that all these years later he could reunite it with its rightful owner. As to be expected, Wes immediately gets to work using the serum. And since Howard is essentially just Dan Kane with a new name, he lets it happen after some weak sauce protestation. Someone could come in. They inject Moses with that verde de la vida, but when nothing seems to happen with him, Wes chalks it up to the reagent being too old. But best check your back, Herbie Dubs, cause Moses is rising from the dead right now. And you thought that was Jesus' gig, huh? A zombie fight breaks out and that guard Mancho returns to get his forearm monched on, but eventually the reanimated Moses grovels at the feet of Warden Brando, and Mancho is able to subdue him. Wes tries to explain that Moses' behavior is the result of an unexpected medication side effect, but Brando is skeptical of his claims. You just added 12 months to your sentence. Wait, what? Wardens can't just add time to a sentence? That's not how our justice system works. They can order inmates into solitary confinement though, which is what the warden does to Moses. West goes to return to his cell, but not before telling Howard what became of Dan Kane. My last partner turned state's evidence against me. Whoa, you're telling me Dan Kane grew a spine? Well, color me impressed. Dan Dan, the state witness man. Meanwhile, new Dan, little Howie, is helping Laura with her injured ankle and making sexy dinner plans with her, which Warden Brando does not appreciate since that was his lady to creep on. Dude, just be happy you're not partaking in this cringeworthy dinner date scene where the two of them have a mock interview about why Howard went to work at the prison. He says that he's there to make a difference, a motivation stemming from that one time he saw his sister die. I wanted to bring her back to life. Then he tells Laura that she reminds him of his sister. My expression. Reminds me of Emily. Your sister. Which strangely leads to them making out. You know what though? Maybe it's not all that strange, thinking back to how he and his sister used to wrestle. Since Moses has been reanimated into a stupid, stupid zombie, Howard is having second thoughts about helping West get back into the mad science game. I want to help people, not create mindless 
freaks. But Wes tells him not to worry, because he's on the verge of being able to restore rational behavior to his zombie experiment. As long as Howie continues to help him out, of course. Cue a montage of science that gets pretty freaking crazy with a whole bunch of dissolves. It's kind of fun the way it covers different parts of the screen as everyone goes about their business. Not bad, Brian Usna. The end of the montage brings us to a new batch of reanimate and a sex scene. Wowie, Howie. But maybe before you got down to business with Laura, you should have taken a look at her work desk. Because apparently she's been researching your weird little doctor friend there. Speaking of West, he takes his new batch of reagent and injects it into Ratty the Rat, then prepares to calm the frantic rodent down with his brand new supplement. This brought him back from the dead. Watch this. We'll give you true life. Herbert's lightning in a bottle there is nanoplasmic energy, or NPE, and he says it will return rational behavior to the reanimated exper- Whoa, dude, we're like in a cell, man. That's wild shit. Unlike Ratty the Rat, who's downright domestic after that shock of NPE. It works. Wes takes Ratty to the prison courtyard and gives Cabrera his pet back buying himself some safety from an ass beating since he is now the re -ratimator. Laura arrives at the prison in her finest pair of stockings so she can convince Warden Brando to give her more access to the building, the better to write her nebulous story. After she winds up in Moses' cell, trying to ask him questions, the zombie gets aggressive towards her. He ends up attacking Warden Brando, which earns him a retaliatory cane beating. The beating knocks Moses out, but Brando thinks he's killed him. And even though Laura promises not to tag for the supposed murder, he still threatens her with sexual violence and pulls a Vince McMahon. You hurt me. Bark! <laughs> Super gross. Just like it was with Trish. We love you, Trish. When Laura refuses to succumb to his power, Brando lashes out at her, and we find out that he ended up killing her when her body is brought to Howard, who responds with an intense shout of vertigo. No! Not you, Laura. Howard clears the room and immediately follows West's suggestion to inject his lady lover's corpse with a batch of glowy goodness. He sticks it in her and she comes back to life, shaking violently and spitting up orange spittle. Er, white spittle? Spitting up spittle of various colors. West then says that they should inject Laura with the NPE of another rat that he has. But before they can resolve the ethical complications inherent to this idea, Warden Brando enters the room. The sight of his reanimated murder victim stuns him long enough for West to use a microscope to get a closer look at Brando's head. With the monstrous warden unconscious, West begins to hook up some electrical doodads so he can harvest some human NPE. You want to put his nanoplasm in a Laura? Rodent to rodent, you had no problem. Human to human, you do? I'll let you guess how long it takes New Dan to crumble. Yep, about three nanoseconds. They stick some prongs in the warden's neck and plug in some stingers, causing a whole bunch of electricity to surge through his body and kill him. The kill proves fruitful for West's pursuit of science since they manage to harvest his NPE into a little jar of fireflies. Make sure you poke some air holes in there now. We see the same virtual tour of this movie's idea of a cell structure as West injects the NPE into Laura. She awakens, seemingly much more human than before, but when West informs her that she was dead for 15 minutes, she starts freaking out, man. And it's not just psychological either. Her body's doing a real weird weird warping thing, and her face turns into a creepy animatronic made by Screaming Mad George. Also, I love how much Elsa Pataki enjoyed the animatronic heads made in her likeness. She seems really fun. No wonder Thor married her. Looks like Brando's NPE has had a profound effect on Laura, though, because she yells at West and Howard in a voice that becomes a lazy layering of her own and the Wardens. Stay away from me! Both of you! Elsewhere in the jail, Moses and Cabrera argue in their cell over whether or not Ratty qualifies as food. The fight is broken up by Mancho, who ends up getting knocked out with his own nightstick, and with his keys at their disposal, Cabrera opens the cell block doors, Hal, and causes a prison riot to break out. Some guards get stunt-tossed over a railing and or pushed around softly in the background, but I'm not counting any of that stuff as kills, since it feels more kids programming than anything lethal. These prisoners are more concerned with rebelling 
nothing against mattresses, I guess. Cabrera, for his part, is just happy to have Ratty again. But when his lovable fur baby goes all rodents with a Z on him, he heads out to beat up West for messing with his beloved pet. Cabrera informs the doctors that there are no guards left to help them. And hey, since that's the case, might as well aggressively harass this woman right here. But Cabrera didn't count on Laura's new temperament, and she manages to get away from it. Howard chases after them, and although I won't count the first two guards he sees as dead, since their fighting's on par with the Adam West Batman series, I will count the two splayed out in this little control center area, since they're clearly meant to be dead, though still in a PG sort of way. Howard ends up getting rescued by some armed reinforcements, who seal him off from the rest of the prison in an effort to keep him safe. That means he won't be able to help Laura, who's now on her own, hiding from angry inmates and discovering more victims for me to add to the count. One guard who's just kinda lying there, and another one who she sees knocked out and dragged away, so I'm just guessing he's dead. Cabrera eventually finds her and approaches her menacingly with two other inmates, but she reaches out in self-defense and chokes out the motherfucking camera. Before taking this opportunity to escape, Wes decides to use that rodent NPE for one final experiment behind bars. He reanimates Warden Brando and gives another cool Jeffrey Combs monologue in a trippy POV sequence. Then he he injects the warden with a mega dose of rat plasma and leaves the lab in a hurry, all while a SWAT team arrives outside to take back control of this prison. Better do it fast, guys, cause we keep getting more victims, like this bloody guard seen crumpled against the railing there. But the SWAT team might be unnecessary, since Warden Brando intends to put down this riot by himself. After freeing himself and knocking out West to steal his medicine bag, he heads to the pharmacy, where Speedball and a buddy of his named Winnie are raiding the place for drugs. The warden, looking pretty ratty there, opens a can of whoop ass on Winnie with his cane, then extends the beating to a still woozy Mancho for letting this riot break out in the first place. He ends up beating Mancho to death, I think, all while Speedball watches with his favorite Showtime snack, drugs. Mm. Brando decides to reanimate Mancho with some reagent from West's back, and the psychedelic psychoactive gets Speedball psycho excited. As he uses the serum to wake up Mancho, Laura wakes up on her own to find those three menacing inmates dead before her eyes. Apparently, she killed them all using a knife, and saved a special fate for Cabrera, who she somehow cut in half. How'd you manage that one, Laura? Got an idle hand there or something? The warden finds Laura and makes his most appealing rat faces at her, not noticing when Speedball steals a couple of syringes out of West's bag. While the warden and zombie Mancho creep out Laura and tie up prisoners to hang, Speedball injects himself with the reagent, kicking off a ridiculous drug trip sequence that sounds like it was scored by Danny Elfman. <laughs> What the fuck? Is Speedball trying to shoot himself up or find his stolen bicycle? Howard makes his way back through the prison and finds West, who he's mighty pissed at. After all, West had said Laura would be normal after the NPE. It was a theory. Oh god, it's you! But I also love you. I, I don't even know anymore. Damn it, West. Herbert tells him that if he wants to find Laura, he should probably look for the warden. The warden? But, but he's dead. God damn you! <laughs> I love it. As they head out to find her, the movie briefly remembers that it had another female character besides Laura. So hey, better have her get sexually assaulted too, right? Thanks, I hate it. Nurse Vanessa escapes from Moses and finds rescue in the SWAT team, who hold the zombie at gunpoint and force him to surrender. When an officer goes to cuff him though, Moses kills him by tearing out his throat. Or maybe he just bit off his ear? I don't know. I feel like counting it as a kill, so let's go with the throat thing. This immediately leads leads to another kill when the remaining SWAT officers all open fire on the reanimated Moses, finally putting down this weird zombie vampire priest character. As they look for Laura, West and Howard come across three prisoners who the warden has hanged. And although they're all shaking like a bunch of haunted house props, I'll just assume they're meant to be actual people who are actually going to die here. So onto the list they go. The warden continues his streak of atrocities by sexually harassing Laura for the third separate time in the 
this movie. Hey filmmakers, you know women can have scenes that like don't involve sex, right? I don't think this movie does know that. But at least in this case, Laura is able to turn the tables on Brando and panectomize him with her teeth. Ouch. Hearing Laura and the warden, Howard runs off to help her, but West is unable to follow since he's attacked by half a reanimated Cabrera, which actually looks really fucking great. Seriously, this is one of the best looking half people effects I've ever seen, and it looks like they did it with some pretty simple green screen pants. West temporarily frees himself of the semi-nuisance by swinging Cabrera around and away, but I guess this ended up being a difficult feat on set since at first they forgot to make a lightweight version of the body. So the day came, and it turns out that the body that they built was like, you know, oh, I don't know, 120 pounds. It's like, well, but, um, that's not possible. When Howard finds Laura, she tells him that her Brando tendencies are taking over, and she would very much like him to kill her, please. Kill me? Okay, Laura, but only if you're wearing a corset. Oh good, you came prepared! Laura gets aggressive again and knocks out both the warden and Howard with Brando's cane, all while that wascally ratty runs away with the warden's genitalia. West finds Speedball, speedballing it up, and tries to confiscate the reagent back from him. But Speedball ain't in the mood for slowing down, so he gives himself another defiant dose. Hmm, wonder what this is about to do. Oh, it's, uh, geez, warping the hell out of his face. And and popping out his eyeball and bursting open his stomach, okay! And yeah, I'm gonna count this as a kill, even if this crappy looking puppet left over appears to be somewhat alive. Hey man, got any more? I don't care what that fake ass thing said, that dude's dead to me. Howard and Laura get into a scuffle that involves her sitting on his face while she beats him. Aw, just like the good old days with Sis, huh Howie? She also does a pretty cool spider walk kind of thing, but yeah, that also ends up with his face in her crotch. As Howie continues reliving his childhood, the warden slinks around using some impressively flexible hip muscles. West wants to see that shit for himself, so he heads to the party, unknowingly being followed by the persistent upper half of Cabrera. West finds the warden and begins to belittle the ratty zombie, but he gets attacked by Cabrera, who somehow flies right at his face. I'm not entirely sure about this kill, but I think West ends up beating Cabrera to death with the warden's cane. Just let me go ahead and count it so we can have a fun half zombie in the numbers, okay? Herbert then pummels Brando into the electric chair, and after strapping him in for a wild ride, throws the switch. The reanimated warden Brando is killed with a bunch of electricity from his own electric chair, which is quite the poetic death. Brando's death is also intercut with the end of Howard and Laura's fight, because although she's straight kicking his ass, a part of her still wants him to kill her. Kill me. <laughs> See? He does so by grabbing a nearby knife and slitting her throat several times with it, getting blood all over himself in the process. In fact, he swipes at her so many times that when West finds him shortly thereafter, Howard's cradling Laura's severed head like he's Angela Baker on a summer camp beach. West doesn't have any sympathy to offer, and instead just steals Howard's credentials and slips the hell out of there. And so, as the SWAT team discovers Howard in a compromising position, West is able to earn some unsanctioned parole by claiming to be the prison's doctor. As West escapes, passing the reanimated Mancho on his way out, Howard is taken away for imprisonment. And it's unclear if he's just seeing things, or if Laura's detached head really is opening her eyes and laughing. But either way, at least Howie's able to have a giggle there, mate. The movie ends with Herbert West walking away into the night with his newly earned freedom in a pretty damn cool shot. Oh, and then during the credits, there's more stuff with Ratty and the Dick. Since the Dick gets reanimated so the two of them can have a shadow boxing match with lots of wacky sound effects. Wow, and the dick wins! I can't show it unblurred here, but just imagine one of those little slug things from Marble Madness. You know, the ones that turned into acid sometimes? Fuck, that game was hard. How many people fell victim to Herbert West's pursuit of a better reagent? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Come on, Raddy, let's go. Raddy, are, are you okay? Ready? <laughs> By my count, there were 23 deaths in Beyond Reanimator, the most of the entire series. The victims included two living women, one reanimated woman, 16 living men, and four reanimated men. Talk about variety. 
With a runtime of 96 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 4.17 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Speedball. I love the way that dude explodes, and I'm just gonna ignore the crappy bloody Muppet that talks to West after it happens. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to the three hanging inmates who keep shaking like a decoration from Halloween USA. You know, the kind that eat up D batteries like Speedball eats up pills. Those batteries aren't cheap, assholes. And that's it. Beyond Reanimator came out in 2003 and is the latest film in the series, which is a little bit surprising, even to Jeffrey Combs. Whether there's another Reanimator movie, I, you know, I, I have to tell you, that is one of the more perplexing uh, things that has happened in my career, is I don't quite understand why there isn't another one. One last fun fact I'll leave you with here. For some reason, this movie's home video release included a bizarre music video for an electronic Eurodance song by an artist known as Dr. Reanimator. The song, Move Your Dead Bones, would be entirely forgettable if it wasn't so horrendously catchy. <laughs> The best thing about this song, though, is that it became popular in the furry community in 2008 after an artist named Zarla made a flash animation music video for it. Man, early internet was something else, y'all. Next week is The Descent, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I have a ton of patrons to thank lately, so thank you Skibo, Quay Dalton, Mikey Myers Jr., New Sheriff of Red Rock, Ryan Corbeil, Brendan Fower, Cameron Duke, Rory Johnson, Scooper Boop, that's fun, Shepard Buckley, Aaron De Niro, and Scott, aka Sharkbiter98. Thank you so much to all of them and all the patrons. Be good people.